thank you, Kathleen. Thanks to everybody who uh, helped make this uh, possible. Um, uh, thanks especially for letting me go to the uh, lemur center today at Duke. Um, I got to feed raisins to a lemur, which is the first time I could ever say that in my life. And, and any day you're feeding raisins to a lemur is a good day. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, this guy. Let me see if my point works. Uh, and I wanted to start by um, asking a question. So. I'm going to show you four slides. Just remember them. We've got G.I. Joe uh, with his lifelike hair and beard, <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, Harry Potter, and Charles Darwin. So what do they all have in common? Well, the answer <laughs> is that they're all going to be in movies this year. <laughs> uh, uh, unfortunately, I could only find a picture of Robert Downey holding a Starbucks coffee cup on the set, <laughs> but I'm sure that it's coming out this year. You got G.I. Joe in his, in his new kind of uh, uh, kinky leather clad outfit, <laughs> Harry Potter getting a little bit long in the tooth for this role, and Paul Bettany starring as Charles Darwin in a movie called Creation with, and I think that's supposed to be his daughter Annie, his wife uh, Jennifer Conley is playing Charles Darwin's wife, Emma. Uh, there is only one person, obviously, in this group who is an actual person. <laughs> and I think that really says something about uh, the uh, incredible celebrity that surrounds Charles Darwin. And um, the, the, thing about, uh, the thing about Darwin is that, I, I think that engages everyone, is that um, he has this idea that, that lets us think about all of life, uh, whether it's uh, oak trees or rattlesnakes or daughters of ours who like to dress up in Snow White costumes or jellyfish or E. coli. He, has, he came forth with an argument that tied all of these things together. So um, uh, actually, uh, in the uh, new issue of Time magazine, uh, I have an article uh, about uh, Darwin on, on the uh, uh, occasion of his birthday. And I think it's going online now. Or maybe t tonight, if you, after this talk, you might be able to find it on their website. Uh, and it's called, uh, it's called Evolving Darwin. And um, the point I make in that article and what, uh, the point I'm going to try to talk a bit about tonight is that uh, while it's great that we're all here uh, celebrating uh, the life and work of Charles Darwin, uh, we have to not succumb to complete insane Darwin mania. Um, uh, Darwin was certainly one of the greatest uh, scientists in, in history, uh, but uh, evolution is, does not equal Darwin. The evolution is more than Darwin. But let's first talk about Darwin. So uh, this, this, uh, this young gentleman here we see, we're, we're usually accustomed to seeing him in that big white beard, but I kind of like this, this picture of him when he was young. Um, was born 200 years ago today uh, to wealthy uh, parents and had kind of a, uh, a uh, sort of a wandering youth. At first he wanted to be a doctor like his father and then that didn't seem to really work out so he uh, went from uh, Edinburgh, where he was studying medicine, to Cambridge to study theology so that he could become a, uh, a, a clergyman, which was what some uh, aimless, intelligent young men of his sort would do. Uh, but he had this incredible passion for natural history. And if circumstances might have been a bit different, he might have... Um, just uh, become a, uh, a, a churchman who did science on the side. And in England in the 19th century, there were a number of, of uh, people who did just that. Um, however, uh, something uh, happened to Darwin. What happened was that he was invited to uh, serve as, as an unofficial uh, comp companion to the captain of a ship, the HMS Beagle. 
uh, which was going to be going around the world. Um, the captain uh, was, uh, was a bit worried that he might go insane uh, on such a long trip and thought that some gentlemanly companionship, intelligent conversation might, might help him to stave this off because his uncle had actually killed himself um, on, a, on a, just such a long voyage. Darwin became kind of the unofficial naturalist of the, of the voyage, uh, and for him it was a totally transformative experience, and partly because he got to go places that no, uh, no uh, English clergyman in the 19th century would ever get to go to. Uh, went all around South Africa, climbed into uh, South Amer uh, America, climbed into the Andes, went to the Galapagos Islands, looked at coral reefs in the, in the Indian Ocean, um, met the, uh, met the uh, Mary of, of New Zealand, and uh, had all sorts of other amazing adventures over the course of five years. Along the way, he picked up uh, fossils. Uh, now, this, this is a, a jawbone of a giant sloth that Darwin found. And Darwin was quite uh, struck by the fact that uh, the fossils that he would find in certain places in South America were kind of like oversized versions of the animals that he could see still alive in South America. Uh, it was as if perhaps these, uh, these extinct animals had somehow given rise to the living animals, like sloths, like rodents, and so on. Uh, Darwin was also... Um, starting to get uh, familiar with uh, the, the new kind of geology that was emerging in the early 19th century. So geologists were beginning to realize that the Earth was not a few thousand years old, but was some inconceivable age. <clears throat> and they could actually read the history of the Earth in its rocks. So for example, um, they, could, they could see how uh, layers of rock that were exposed at the surface were stacked up on each other and then tilted in different ways and then shot through with, uh, with the volcanic rock. And in this, 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 uh, in this chart, the, the, the colors show different ages of rock. And then paleontologists started noticing that there were distinctive fossils that would be found in these different layers. So life was changing through time very gradually. Of course, one of the uh, most uh, famous stops that Darwin made was at the Galapagos Islands, which are uh, about 700 miles off the coast of South America. And uh, there he encountered all sorts of unusual animals, uh, animals that, uh, species that he couldn't, that were not known from anywhere else. <coughs> and he found birds, for example that turned out to be quite perplexing for him. So he picked up these birds and he could see, well, obviously they have these incredibly uh, different beaks. And just through observation, you could see that <coughs> the big ones were good for cracking nuts, uh, seeds, I should say. And there were birds with slender beaks that would use them to sort of pick out uh, food, maybe uh, among cactus spines. Uh, when Darwin got home, he gave them to an ornithologist and uh, assumed that the ornithologist would tell him, well, you found uh, wrens and you found mockingbirds and you found all these different uh, kinds of birds. And the ornithologist, uh, James Gould, came back to him and said, they're all finches. And he said, what do you mean they're all finches? He said, they're all finches. The, despite the beaks, they have all these other similarities that just show you they're finches. And so Darwin was left with this puzzle. How could you have uh, finches, a, a one particular genus, have all these different shapes all in one island? Uh, the, the idea that somehow uh, species were specially created where you found them uh, didn't fit with this idea because why would, why would such an incredible range of species be created in one spot? It didn't make sense. And so Darwin, when he got home, started jotting things down in a notebook. And, and one of the, the most wonderful things that he jotted down, I wrote about this in the New York Times, is a tree. So he began to imagine that you'd have these different species alive today, like the ones he's marked with these letters uh, B, uh, 
I guess it's an A, A, B, C, D. So maybe those are species that are alive today. And they descended from a common ancestor that split off in these different directions. And then all, most of these branches became extinct. Maybe you'd find their fossils if you were lucky. And all you're left with are a few tips of the branches. And what I love here is this little note he made, I think. <laughs> He was still developing this theory, uh, and uh, one of the things that he had to figure out was how do you make the tree split? How do you, how do you drive uh, this, this branching process in life? Uh, he uh, realized that one very important way is through something that he called natural selection. And he would hang out a lot with uh, pigeon breeders to get uh, some ideas about how this process called natural selection happened. So, uh, so pigeon breeders would um, tell him about how you could uh, raise pigeons and selectively breed them for certain traits. And then just from you know, some uh, ancestral, ordinary looking pigeon, all these incredible uh, breeds had, had been developed. And so Darwin. Uh, said, well, you know, nature is selecting as well. Because in every generation, there's variation. Some animals are bigger than other animals. Uh, and they're, they're varying in lots of other ways. If any of those variations lets some individuals reproduce more than others, lets them survive longer, for example, um, then there are going to be more of them in the next generation. And if you just repeat this, over those vast stretches of time that Darwin was beginning to recognize uh, existed through the history of the Earth. If you just do that for millions upon millions of years, Darwin argued that you could make that tree split and branch, and you could produce new forms of life. Um, it uh, took him um, about 20 years before he finally really went public with it. Um, th it's, it's been said that Darwin was terrified um, of going public. And that's not really true, it turns out. He was just an incredibly methodical man, uh, almost tediously so. <laughs> this is someone who spent eight years uh, studying barnacles <laughs> because he wasn't quite sure about certain aspects of his theory. And he thought, maybe if I looked at barnacles, I might be able to figure it out. Eight years later, he figured it out. He published a major monograph on barnacles, and then he was able to move on. So he just had a lot of work to do. Uh, part of it was that he, he knew that when, when he did publish uh, his ideas, that he would be attacked, because he had seen other people attacked for other kinds of evolution that they were arguing for. So he wanted to, to be able to try to address every possible objection that someone might have. Uh, actually. Uh, he um, uh, was, was pushed a little uh, sooner than he expected to publish because he got a letter from um, a correspondent, uh, Alfred uh, Russell Wallace, who uh, was in Southeast Asia. He was a naturalist who would supply people like Darwin with uh, birds and other, other an animals and such. And he wrote this letter saying, I've got this idea. And, and it was basically saying, he didn't, I don't think he, he didn't use the word natural selection, but essentially he was talking about natural selection. Charles Darwin reads this letter and thinks, uh oh, <laughs> I got to do something. So what ended up happening was that a letter was read to the Linnaean Society um, in 1858 with um, remarks from both Darwin and Wallace. And it was later published in, a, in the Linnaean Society's journal. Um, so Darwin thought, OK, that's just not good enough. I have spent 20 years, and I, and I, and I can't just, just try to sum it all up in a few pages. So I'm going to write a book. Um, and then he thought, no, if I write a whole book, it's going to be 5,000 pages long. So I'm going to just write an abstract to that book. That abstract became The Origin of Species. <laughs> um, so that's this, so the origin of species, which is a, a couple hundred pages long, is just a just a, an introduction <laughs> to Darwin's ideas. He he wrote other ideas, other books later about human evolution, about uh, carnivorous plants, about orchids, uh, and and talked about some of his other uh, ideas about evolution. 
but the Orchid of Species really does stand out as, um, as, as the best summing up uh, of his theory. And it just so happens that in November, it'll be the 150th anniversary of the Origin of Species. So you're not done yet with all the Darwin stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Darwin was capable of, of rising to, to great poetic heights. Uh, he ends the Origin of Species saying, there is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Uh, as, as a journalist, I, I can't help but uh, uh, point out that uh, people recognize the importance of Darwin's book pretty quickly. Um, this is, as far as I can tell, the first reaction in the United States to the origin of species uh, in the New York Times in, in 1860 when the American edition was published. Uh, it was actually a big full page uh, article and um, there was one line that really popped out at me saying that Darwin has, quote, laid the foundations of one of the mightiest changes in philosophical thought. Uh, in, in my own experience as a, as a writer, I, I like to write about life and I like to write about all the weirdness that's around us. And when you do that, you have to write about how life got to be that way. And so there is basically uh, nothing else to do but to write about evolution. It is part and parcel of writing about biology today. So this is an article I, I wrote about jellyfish. Uh, I think jellyfish are just completely fascinating. Um, and it turns out that there are a lot more similarities between us and jellyfish than have been previously appreciated. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, that we descended from a common ancestor that had a lot more of the traits uh, that we thought were just unique to us. So in, in my article for time, um, I, I take a look at some of Darwin's key arguments. And, and talk about what we know about them today. So, so one of the, the most fundamental ones is, is summed up in this picture, that, that life evolves and has evolved like a tree. And I, there, there's really no better example I can think of to talk about this than uh, dolphins and whales, um, in part because they're just so cool. Um, I, I, before the, the, the talk here, we, there was a small reception, and to get there, I had to walk underneath these skeletons of whales at the museum. Uh, I almost didn't make it to get any food because I was just spellbound by these beautiful skeletons that are suspended in air of blue whales and sperm whales and so on. Um, there's something incredibly captivating about whales and dolphins. Um, and part of it is, is uh, just how strange they are. Um, they live basically like fish, but uh, if you open them up, they are not like fish. Uh, for ex most importantly, they've got big lungs, big lungs that actually connect to, um, to a, a, a blowhole. They have huge brains. They've got uh, these, these flippers that are not like any fish you'll see in the ocean. And they've got uh, their tail uh, which is uh, about 90 degrees off kilter compared to other uh, animals in the sea. So if you see a, a, a shark, it's going to be swimming like this. If you see a whale or a dolphin, it'll be going like this. So there's something really off <laughs> about whales and dolphins. And there was a huge debate uh, well into the 1800s about what these things were. Um, Linnaeus in the 1700s classified whales as mammals because they, <clears throat> because they had lungs, because they gave birth to live young, because they nursed uh, their young with milk. A lot of people thought it was kind of crazy and disagreed, and including Herman Melville, who, or at least uh, Ishmael, who, who says, be it known that waving all argument, I take the good old fashioned ground that a whale is a fish and call upon holy Jonah to back me. Uh, Darwin uh, speculated a little about whales, or at least how something like a whale could evolve. Um, he wrote about um, uh, an anecdote 
that some naturalist had seen a bear swimming around in the water with its mouth open catching bugs. And he said, well, you could imagine that uh, bears uh, at, over the course of many generations that had specialized for swimming around with their mouths open could have evolved into whales. And for this, he was, was uh, mocked uh, quite, quite a lot in, in the press. And in later editions of The Origin of Species, he actually uh, cut out a lot of that description. I, you get the feeling he would thought, well, I'm pushing it a little too much here. Um, nevertheless, um, you, have, uh, you have whales with very mammal-like anatomy in the water. Darwin's theory predicts that they must have evolved from land mammals. Fortunately, there are a lot of ways today that we can test that idea that, that Darwin did not have. And, and one of the most important ways is by looking at DNA. So Darwin knew that traits were carried on from one generation to the next. He had really no idea why. <clears throat> now we know that all life on Earth uses DNA to encode uh, information for building uh, more things like themselves. So all of us have uh, these DNA molecules uh, that are kind of like cookbooks. And these little uh, rungs in this ladder are actually kind of like letters in that cookbook. And we have three and a half billion uh, letters in our human cookbook. Whales and dolphins have their own cookbook that they carry around. Uh, every now and then, uh, one of those letters might spontaneously change. Every now and then, uh, a chunk of DNA may be cut out or might be accidentally copied. Things uh, undergo what are called mutations. So uh, all of us have our own mutations. Most of them are pretty harmless. Um, some of them <clears throat> are quite harmful and can cause an early death or may lead to a, a, still, a stillborn baby. Um, a few are beneficial, and that's what natural selection works on, the beneficial mutations. And beneficial mutations can become more common because the individuals that carry those mutations are able to have more kids. So um, DNA has now given rise to a whole industry of uh, tracing human origins. And uh, so um, there, you can find out who your, your relatives are. Um, there's a study that came out that showed that uh, a, a huge fraction of people from Ireland uh, or of Irish descent descend from one king. Uh, here you can, uh, you, know, you can go and get <clears throat> your own DNA tested if you want. Uh, you know, is he your dad? <laughs> Or is, is he your son? Uh, this, is, this, is, this is regular business. <clears throat> and the way that, that the, this kind of work is done is by looking at these differences in people's DNA, the, these inherited differences. Um, if you take that basic method and instead of comparing the, the DNA in people, compare different species, you get a different kind of genealogy. You get an evolutionary tree kind that Darwin was drawing in his book. So for whales, scientists have been taking DNA from whales <coughs> and from other mammals. Uh, and what they find is that the cetacea here, that represents whales and dolphins, what you find is that they are mammals. They belong to sort of the mammal uh, group. And their closest relatives are hippos. They belong to a group of mammals, the hoofed mammals, uh, even, uh, called artiodactyls. And it inc includes giraffes and cows and, and pigs and camels and, and some other land mammals. So they're, they're stuck right in there in this group of land mammals. So that is consistent with Darwin's idea that whales evolved from land mammals. And it tells you exactly which land mammals they evolved from. Um, now, it would, it would be nice to have some fossils of, uh, these, uh, of the intermediates of species of early whales that were adapting to life in the water. I mean, they ought to exist. They ought to be out there if Darwin was right. Um, and in the early 1990s, uh, a paleontologist named Hans Tevesen, uh, who actually did a postdoc at Duke, um, found the first 
really good, complete <coughs> skeleton of a whale with legs that could walk. It's called Ambulocetus. And here you can see uh, its back leg and the front leg. They know it's a whale because it has certain traits in its skeleton that are only found today in whales and not found in any other mammals. So for example, the whales have very peculiar ears with distinctive bony walls around them. Ambulocetus has got that too. So this is a whale. And this is probably what it looked like. Um, my next book is called uh, The Tangled Bank, An Introduction to Evolution. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a picture that uh, Carl Buell, a wonderful illustrator, has just done for it, um, working with Hans Tevesen. And so this is probably what it looked like. Um, and as you can see, it, it was probably a, a, an under, a, sort of an amphibious predator. So it could stay on land. Uh, it could breathe. It had a, sort of a regular kind of mammal nose, as you can see. But it had a kind of otter-like body that it, that, that it could use to swim around underwater very quickly and catch prey, uh, maybe like this, this fish here. Um, it was big. It was, uh, I believe, seven or eight feet long. So it could, it could go after some pretty big prey. So um, th there was a kind of a controversy for a while between the paleontologists and the geneticists. Because as I told you before, the geneticists said, yeah, whales are mammals, and there are these artiodactyls. And the paleontologists said, mm, I don't think so. Because artiodactyls all have a distinctive ankle bone. It has what is called a double pulley. So it's surrounded on both ends. And it helps, it helps the, uh, the mammals kind of lock in their legs when uh, they're running. And uh, no, one could f no one could find um, a double pulley ankle on, on a whale. They couldn't find any ankle on a, on a fossil whale for a while. Um, and what were thought to be the closest fossil relatives of whales didn't seem to have this double pulley either. But that all changed in 2001 when um, a scientist named Phil Gingrich at the University of Michigan dug up a fossil called Rhodocetus, which was complete enough that, um, that he, got, he got the ankle bone and it had that double pulley. So there's, a, there's, a, there's this beautiful agreement between the fossils and the DNA. Uh, and, and it all supports Darwin's basic assertion that whales evolved from land mammals. Uh, and since then, there have been a whole bunch of other uh, whale fossils that have been found. And, and I've just, uh, I had Carl Buell put together a few of them here, again, in this, this book, The Tangled Bank, um, just to show you the transformation that has happened. So, so you start up here with a common ancestor of hippos and, and whales about maybe 55 million years ago. And you have this branching process. And so you have these species, as you can see, they're getting more and more adapted to living in water. At first, uh, they look like pretty generic land animals, like a coyote or something. Their legs start to change. Their tail starts to change. They become more and more adapted to living in water. They probably were, were more like seals at this point. By now, about, um, well, I guess about 42 million years ago, their legs are so small that, that uh, there's no way they could walk on them. But they're still legs. That's the amazing thing. There's a species uh, that's related uh, to Dorodon called Basilosaurus. It got to be 50 feet long, so it would just go across, you could lay it out across the stage. And the, they found the fossils of its hind leg. They're about as big as a child's. And they're just hanging off the back over here. So people have argued a lot about whether they're just sort of carried along by evolution or maybe they were being used for something. Maybe the, male, the whales used them during the mating process, kind of claspers. Hard to say unless you were to find a fossil, two fossils of, of <laughs> whales going at it. Uh, um, another neat transition is, is the nose. The nostrils start out at the end here, like in a good, respectable land mammal. They start to move back a little, back a little more, and then they move all the way up to, to become the blowhole in the two major groups of whales, um, the toothed whales and the baleen whales. Um, 
so evolutionary trees have uh, shown lots of, of other uh, amazing things about, not just about life, but about the Earth. Uh, and so here's another example. These things are, um, are about as far from whales as you can get. <laughs> they're called mite harvestmen, and they're about that big, <laughs> and they live in the forest, on the forest floor, and they'd be lucky if they travel 50 feet in their life. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, what, could, what possibly could you learn from studying mite harvestmen? Well, the interesting thing about mite harvestmen is the very fact that they don't move around. And so some scientists went around the world and studied the DNA of mite harvestmen and did a tree. There are thousands of species of mite harvestmen in the world. And here's one group down here. They're all related from a common ancestor. They're in yellow. And this is where they all live. So how does a mite harvestman get from Argentina to South Africa to Sri Lanka to Australia and, um, and to New Zealand? How does that work? Um, obviously, they, they don't hop on ships. Um, they don't fly. So how are they going to get there? Well, if you go back 150 million years ago, all that habitat was connected in one landmass. So they haven't gone anywhere. It's the continents that have moved apart. <laughs> and the story of continental drift is actually encoded in their DNA. So uh, even, even the smallest uh, creature can tell you something interesting. So evolutionary trees, just to, to sum up, are, are, uh, are uh, uh, fundamentally uh, vital to how we understand life today. So from that little sketchbook, we have gone to evolutionary trees showing us how whales evolved, how continents have moved around, and scientists are now trying to put together a tree of all life. This doesn't get anywhere near close. It's just got a few hundred species in it, but it does give you a, one important uh, message, which is that most life, marked in green and purple, are microbes. So, so that's you, that's a mushroom, and that's this plant. We take up a very small part of the tree of life. Um, natural selection. Uh, ha so how has natural selection fared? Well, pretty well. Um, natural selection is not the only process that can cause evolutionary change. That is clear. Um, there are processes that I won't talk about too much tonight. Uh, one's called genetic drift, where genes just sort of become more common, really through a luck of the draw, just randomness. Uh, there's sexual selection, where uh, males are attracted to females with certain traits, and females are attracted to males with certain traits. So you, you can understand how um, peacocks get gigantic feathers uh, as a result of that. But natural selection does turn out to be <coughs> real and very important, and you can actually watch it happen in real time. Um, I've, writ I've written about uh, Richard Lenski in the, in the Times and elsewhere at Michigan State University, he started an experiment with E. coli um, in about 20 years ago. And what he did was he uh, started with one E. coli and uh, grew 12 identical colonies from it and then put them in flasks. And in that, those flasks was a little bit of sugar. And they would run through the sugar over the course of, it, of the morning and then they would run out of food. And they would just have to survive until the next morning when Lenski and his students would take a little bit of that solution and stick it in a flask with a fresh supply of food, and they could reproduce. And they would do that again and again and again and again and again and again for 20 years. <laughs> so they're up to, uh, I think they're almost up to 50,000 generations of E. coli now. Um, and what, what the neat thing that they can do is they can freeze some of these bacteria uh, every 500 generations or so. They have these huge freezers in their lab where they, keep, uh, where they keep what they call the frozen fossil record. And whenever they want, they can reach in there, thaw out these bacteria, and compare them to their descendants. And they can see, for example, how fast they grow uh, compared to their descendants on the same diet. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that after uh, 50,000 generations or so, they are fat. They are about twice as big as their, uh, their ancestors. And they're not really sure why, why they got so big.
but, but the, the really crucial thing is that they are better at surviving in that environment than their ancestors. And, and Lenski can, can draw a graph of it. And he's even got these things which scientists love, uh, error bars, which means that he, because he's looking at 12 different populations, he's not just looking at one group of E. coli and he's got some fluke. He's got the whole thing. And, um, and this just, just shows you how fast they reproduce compared to their ancestors. So natural selection, yes. <laughs> So where do new traits come from? Um, one example I, I love to give about this <clears throat> is, is it just sort of gets, gets to the total weirdness of biology. So you may have seen Alien where um, he's, this, this creature has this little set of jaws inside that reach out and pull out your heart. Of course, it's science fiction, right? Well, uh, some scientists uh, at the University of California at uh, Irvine were studying Maury eels, and they were feeding him things. And I want you to look very carefully right here. Ooh. They suddenly realized that these Maury eels were pulling in things with some set of jaws inside their throat. And this is an x-ray. These things get thrust forward into their mouth, grab onto food, and then drag it down into their throat. And this is a drawing of it. So here's something just totally out of the blue, totally new. Other fish don't have it. We thought only aliens had it. <laughs> now we found you know, one kind of animal that has it. So did it just come out of the blue? No. Uh, one thing that, Dick, uh, that Charles Darwin recognized was that, uh, that complex new traits could evolve through a tinkering process with old traits that did other things. So lots of fish have an extra set of jaws in the back called pharyngeal jaws. They use it just to grind food up and kind of just to suck it back. And um, whoops. So the, those are the pharyngeal jaws. And essentially what has happened with, with, the, with the moray eels is that they have modified the muscles and the bones to create something new, but it's not totally out of the blue. Uh, one thing that would surprise Darwin is, is how um, this process, what scientists sometimes call exaptation, um, can happen at a molecular level. It's not just taking like new uh, bones and having them do new things. It's taking genes and making them do new things. The example I like to use is from snakes. So uh, snake, snake venom is produced in a gland, and in, in some snakes is shot through these fangs into their, into their prey. And venoms are these, these beautiful molecules that are incredibly deadly in a very elegant way. They might lock on to a receptor on a neuron. Um, they, they have this intimate association with the biology of their victim. And snakes typically have a whole cocktail of different venoms. And so um, in order to figure out where these venoms evolved from, uh, a a biologist uh, named Brian Fry started uh, grabbing snakes, incredibly deadly snakes, and taking their, taking their venom to study. And of course, you have to have a crazy Australian scientist to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> Where would we be without them? <laughs> so there were some ideas that, that venomous snakes had evolved their venom independently, or maybe they all evolved them from a common ancestor. So, uh, so Brian. Uh, what he did was he was able to, to uh, get the cells that were producing the venom um, and, and by, by these various procedures here and identifying the genes that produce the venom in these different species. And he would get results like this. That's kind of hard to read, but I'll just, the, the basic point is this. Here, these are all these different genes from different species for the same kind of venom. And they all have their, they share an evolution. They, they, they descend from a common ancestor, just like we do. Their closest relative, however, is a gene that's for an enzyme in the pancreas, a digestive enzyme. So what this suggests is that uh, the, the, this venom gene was borrowed. So genes can be borrowed because they have the, there are these little stretches of DNA next to them that act like switches that sort of say when to turn them on, under what conditions, where in the body. So snakes underwent this mutation where um, they, uh, uh, th this gene started being produced in the mouth 
rather than the pancreas. And Fry has discovered genes being borrowed all over the body for different venoms. So there's this massive process of borrowing genes to produce this new feature, venom. Uh, and this, this led uh, Brian to an incredible discovery, which was that, um, that it turned out that uh, snakes that we didn't think were venomous make venom too. And by looking at the evolution of venom, he, he realized that he should look at snakes that no one thought were venomous before, and he discovered them. So then he asks, okay, well, wait a minute. Maybe, uh, maybe venom evolved before snakes. The closest relatives of snakes are <clears throat> these lizards, like uh, the Komodo dragon, for example, and iguanas. So being the crazy Australian biologist, <laughs> he went out and started um, getting samples uh, from the mouths of these lizards, such as this lace monitor, which is six feet long. And this is what it does when it's angry. <laughs> uh, he's still alive, I'm happy to report. Uh, and as I wrote in this article in the New York Times, it turns out that uh, some lizards, the closest relatives to snakes, are venomous as well. And they produce the same venoms as in snakes. So all of a sudden, we have this whole group of reptiles that turn out to be venomous because they share a very distant ancestor with snakes that, that first evolved venom. And this is very important because venom um, is actually medically very important. A lot of drugs are derived from venom. And now we have a whole bunch of new targets for potential drugs. Um, there were some, some areas of, uh, of life that Darwin didn't really want to mess with. Uh, and one of them was how life began. So if we all share this common ancestry, then life must have started here, I guess. Uh, and we have an incredible fossil record now going back about 3.4, 3.5 billion years. People are debating about whether these really ancient fossils are, some of them may be evidence of life, some of them may, might not. But in any case, this is one fossil that's generally very well agreed on, 3.4 billion years old from Australia, probably formed by this kind of uh, bacterial uh, mat called stromatolites. Um, Darwin thought there was no way that you could figure out how life began because, um, because you couldn't see it going on today. He was very interested in seeing things going on today. Uh, and this is a letter he wrote where, you know, if we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, et cetera, at present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes, uh, at the present day, such a matter would be instantly devoured or absorbed, which would not have been the case before living creatures were formed. So he left that alone. Uh, and yet, uh, it turns out that he might be right uh, to some extent. Uh, it's possible that these kinds of environments may have been where life got its start, or at least where some of the compounds for life got their start. Uh, so for example, um, sugars could have formed through um, lightning, uh, through other chemical processes on Earth before life began. Um, there has, there's been a lot of research on how uh, other the basic building blocks of molecules of life could have been brought by comets, for example. And researchers are now even trying to create these sort of early versions of life, protocells. And this is an animation <coughs> showing what they envision a protocell to be like. Instead of DNA, which is a double strand, they think that life uh, before that was RNA, a single strand. Um, and they've actually been able to make protocells like this in the lab um, that do a lot of these things where they can, they can uh, make new molecules, they can separate like this. Um, they don't have all the, the bells and whistles that our cells do, but life might indeed have started out uh, at least at one, at one stage in the early evolution of life might have looked like this. Um, now, I, at the beginning, I told you about how you know, the, the, the tree of life has, has uh, really been quite well supported by lots and lots of different studies. On the other hand, it, it might not just be a tree. 
And this might seem kind of paradoxical for me to say that. Um, but when you look at, at Darwin's sketch, he's just seeing branches splitting apart. And so all that genetic material in, in that original species is getting split off into two separate species. There's, there's no coming back together in, in his tree. Now, but on the other hand, Darwin did know that plants would hybridize. So in a sense, that's bringing the branches back together. Uh, in Microcosm, uh, a book that I published last year, I talked about how uh, studies on E. coli in particular have helped scientists to realize that there is actually a lot of this joining together of the branches in the tree of life that's going on, especially among microbes. And since microbes make up most of the genetic diversity of life on Earth, this is important. So you may have heard about um, E. coli uh, in terms of <laughs> spinach or tainted beef or so on. Now, you all have E. coli in you right now, I should point out. You're perfectly healthy, and you have a very happy relationship with a billion or so E. coli inside of you at this moment. If, however, you get a strain of E. coli in you called O157H7, things will not be so good. Uh, and uh, the, there have been outbreaks in recent years uh, of, of this particular strain of E. coli. And so scientists have looked at its genome, and they've been stunned to find that there are lots of genes in this particular strain of E. coli that cause the spinach outbreak that are not found in any other strain of E. coli. They, they've been brought in from somewhere else. And it turns out there are lots of ways to get genes from one bacteria to another, from one cell to another. Viruses can carry genes over. Um, sometimes bacteria just drink up naked DNA. It's something they like to eat. Um, but then all of a sudden, your, your dinner becomes your genes. It's, it's, a, it's a strange thing, but uh, this happens a lot in the bacterial world. It's one reason why uh, antibiotic resistance is such a problem. And it turns out that it's happening not just in the bacteria that make us sick, but in uh, just in lots of, of microbes in the oceans, in the soils. This is a major process. So one way to think about it is, is to think about this tree, which um, a scientist named Tal Degan put together. She looked at um, a couple hundred uh, bac uh, bacteria and compared them and their, their genes to figure out how they're related to each other. And she drew this tree with each tip being a species uh, of bacteria she was looking at. And so it's a very elegant kind of three-dimensional tree sh showing their relationships. And then she started looking at these genes that clearly have jumped from one, one species to another. They're found in one, you know, in one part of, you might, for example, find genes that were found in, in all of these related groups of bacteria, and then just one species over here. So you can pretty much, uh, it's a pretty safe bet that that gene got from here over to there. A virus may have carried it from one host to another, for example. So, so this is what she ended up with. So you can still barely make out that tree. The tree is in there, but you have to kind of push away all these vines to get at it. So think, when you think of a tree, Think of the jungle, and that's probably, what, that's probably what life is like, or at least a lot of life. So just to wrap up, um, of course, uh, the, one of the biggest impacts that Darwin had was on how we think about ourselves. Uh, and in The Origin of Species, Darwin was very coy about humans. He actually wrote to a friend. He wasn't going to say much about humans in The Origin of Species because he didn't want to prejudice people to his views. Uh, but he had plenty of ideas, and he published them in The Descent of Man, a book in 1871. Um, and there he, he um, brought together um, a lot of ideas that he had been thinking about for years, really since he got back from the Beagle. Um, you know, people at the time uh, believed, at least some people believed, that uh, different races had been separately created. Darwin rejected this and believed that all humans uh, descended from a common ancestor. And part of the, the reason for that was that he would hang out with Indians in Patagonia. And as different as they were sort of superficially, he 
he could see a kinship with them. And he would write about uh, here uh, the many little traits of character showing how similar their minds were to ours. Um, this, was a this was a fairly radical thing to be talking about at that time. Um, Darwin also saw a lot of similarities uh, between ourselves and other animals. So Darwin saw us as animals sharing a common ancestry with other animals. And you could see that in everything from you know, our little tail stump uh, on our backs to facial expressions. He was fascinated by um, the expressions that children would make. Uh, and he would also spend a lot of time at zoos looking at the facial expressions that uh, chimpanzees and orangutans would make. And he would see all of these, these, these shared traits that for him were made an overwhelming case that, that we had evolved from, from ape-like ancestors. At the time, he had very few fossils to look at to, um, to make this kind of an argument. There was some mysterious bones of something called Neanderthal man that had been discovered. But people were arguing about just what they were. Some people thought that it was a different species. Some people thought it was just a human with a big brow. They weren't sure. It was only after Darwin's death that uh, some fossils that were, were truly intermediate, kind of like the walking whales, were discovered for humans. So uh, Raymond Dart, in 1925, discovered this thing he's holding here um, uh, uh, called Australopithecus, which had, um, which had certain features like humans and then certain features like uh, chimpanzees and other apes, like big teeth, for example. Um, and he called them an extinct race of apes, intermediate living between living anthropoids, that's apes and monkeys, and man. Um, this, was, this was quite a controversial thing to say at the time. Um, there was a letter to the Times in London uh, where someone wrote about Dart saying, man, stop and think. You have become one of the devil's best arguments in sending souls to grope in the darkness. Uh, and I sympathize because I've gotten emails like this. Fortunately, we've got a wonderful fossil record now of what are called hominids. So that's, that's humans and, and all other uh, primates that are more closely related to us than to chimpanzees, our closest living relative. And they start around 7 million years ago and go up through time. We are the last surviving species of these hominids. And I should go back. So here, one of the earliest ones called auroran shows that um, early hominids were probably already fairly upright. Darwin thought that being upright uh, was uh, something that evolved along with powerful brains, the ability to make tools, and so on. He thought that it all happened at the same time. And in this case, he was quite wrong. Uh, we have huge brains compared to chimpanzees, but those brains really didn't get big until maybe about a million years ago. So chimpanzee brains are about down here, and they sort of hang out until here, and then they start to shoot up. Exactly what drove that expansion is not clear, uh, but there are a lot of really interesting lines of research that are going on now that I'm sure Darwin had been, been fascinated by. One idea is that uh, it's our social life that made our brain so big. It wasn't technology. It was just being with other hominids. Um, so as a general rule, uh, primates that live in bigger groups tend to have certain parts of the brain that are bigger as well. And here's the graph to show it. You can see that uh, the bigger you get, the bigger your what's called neocortex gets. And then maybe because to be in a big group, you've got to do a lot of calculations. Who's your friend? Who's your enemy? Um, who you can trust, who you can't, who you're going to have a grudge against, and who you're going to forgive, all that. You know, who are you going to pick lice out of their hair today or tomorrow? It's a, it's a busy social calendar you have if you're a baboon. And it's probably even busier if you're a hominid living in a group of, say, 150 other hominids out on the savanna, all having to work together to stay alive. Um, Another uh, thing we're gonna, that's going to help us learn about this hypothesis, this social brain hypothesis, will be, amazingly enough, DNA from fossils. Um, so uh, just today, it was announced that scientists have completed the rough draft of the Neanderthal genome. They've got the whole, well, just about the whole genome of a Neanderthal from a fossil about 37,000 years ago. 
So Neanderthals were our closest relatives. And now scientists are going to be able to look for genes in a Neanderthal genome, compare them to ours. And they're going to be able to focus in on genes that are involved in building brains, genes that we know are important for being a social animal. And we're going to see what we had in common with Neanderthals and what we evolved after we branched off from them about half a million years ago. So this is amazing stuff. Now, one thing that's really incredible is that um, they actually only have about two-thirds of the genome complete because there's all this stuff in the genome which are called repetitive sequences. Lots of bits of DNA that just repeat, 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 repeat. They're very hard to sequence. They're not genes. Uh, actually, they take up a huge amount of our genome. Um, over half of it, of our genome, is made up of this repetitive stuff. And a lot of it may have come from viruses, viruses that infected us millions of years ago and got incorporated into our genome and then got trapped there. And then all they could do was copy their own DNA and insert it back into our genome, make extra copies of themselves. So we all carry millions of dead viruses and fragments of viruses in our DNA. Um, and in a way, that's sort of the ultimate uh, uh, challenge to the tree of life, that, that we are not even really human. We are, we are part human and part virus. Uh, and you know, th this was not something that you'll find in the origin of species, but I think that Darwin would have loved to find out more about it. So thank you so much for coming.